What's up guys, welcome to Voicey here, this is your host, Captain Zach, and today's subreddit is r slash I don't work your lady with a story from r slash today I fudged up, and the today I fudged up stories a lot longer than the I don't work your lady story because there were no more stories on there. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to never miss an episode. This story is called Same Uniform, Different Store. I'm a cashier in a store a couple towns away and pass through a town with another of our stores on the way to slash from work. To make it easier, I'll call my store, Store A, and the other store, Store B. Both stores shut at 8 p.m., but there are people there after hours to tidy and prepare the store for the next day. None are cashiers. I have considered transferring to Store B as it is roughly half the distance, but have decided not to for several reasons, including the staff always looks miserable in there. It's thought of as being a rough area, and the reason I am posting this. Just around the corner from Store B, there is a supermarket with a fueling station, and I fill up there as they're usually cheaper and have points and rewards thing. Over the road is a car dealership that sells some really nice cars, think Ferrari, Lamborghini, Aston Martin, Porsche, etc. I usually get changed out of my uniform before I leave work if I'm planning on going anywhere on the way home, including getting fuel. One day I was on the closing shift and it was my last shift before a week holiday. I was driving up country for a few days, and I had planned on getting fuel on the way the next day so I didn't get changed. I don't know why, but I changed my mind and filled up on the way home. This was a mistake. I was stood there, putting fuel in my car and looking over at the nice cars for sale, when suddenly I hear a woman screaming, Hey, what the hell are you doing here? At first, I thought it was just two people that had fallen out and were about to argue or fight. This was also a mistake. A woman gets out of the car at the next pump and comes over, grabs me, yanks me around to face her, and starts shouting at me. Being in uniform, I didn't want to escalate the situation, so I asked her to quiet down and to tell me who she was and what she's talking about. She acted like I was the least intelligent person to ever exist and told me she was a manager in Store B, and shouts that I should be at work and she's not paying me to lounge around like a moron and she's going to dock my pay. I told her I'm a cashier in store A several times throughout the conversation. I was scheduled up until they shut 15 to 20 minutes ago, meaning there's nothing for me to go back to do and wouldn't get paid if I did stay. She was having none of it. She demanded to have my name and employee number. I kind of gave up at this point, so I asked her what sort of manager doesn't know their employees. Feels like they can shout at people outside of work, whether they work for her or not, like me, in a built-up public place and grab them in the way she did and that she should leave me alone immediately, otherwise police and head office will be called. Both of whom I'm sure would love to hear about a manager assaulting staff from another store nowhere near either store while both are in uniform. And they can see the evidence on the fueling station CCTV. She backed off a little, demanding I go to the office the following morning, even if I'm not working that day. I told her that as I'm now on holiday for the next week, if I have to go to her office, I expect to be reimbursed for the holiday time I'll be missing. She started screaming again, so I told her I finished, so we'll carry it on tomorrow where I will get paid. Got my car, told her to stand back so I don't run her toes over, and left. Pay it pump. The following morning, I phoned store A and told them the situation and told them she said I'd get the day of holiday back and paid, which she did mention, and as expected, they refused. I then phoned store B, she didn't answer but another manager did, and explained in detail what happened and that I'm unable to attend, and told them I didn't want anything from it except a guarantee that it won't happen to anyone else. The day I went back to work, she came in and saw me working there. I asked if she believed where I work now, and she turned white as a ghost and left. My boss saw me and told me she overheard the manager on the phone to the head office explaining what had happened and she asked why my name was being used so much. The manager explained what happened and was told the lady was no longer going to have any authority anymore if she was lucky to remain employed in any of our stores. She's still employed, but no longer a manager. Hey, would you look at that? Swift justice, entitled person gets what's coming to him. Hell yeah, this is, this is a story I like, okay? Sometimes it's nice to get an ending where, you know, we are all 
Off with their heads with the Karens, you know? Sometimes death and destruction is the way to go. This story's called, Today I Fudged Up by Taking My Aunt to a Japanese Love Hotel. So this happened last spring in Japan. It's a long read, but I promise it's good. The start of this F up dates back to a month before the actual incident. I live in Japan and my aunt was going to come visit me during Golden Week. I was responsible for planning the trip. Only problem was, Golden Week is the most popular time for domestic travel in Japan, so accommodation was scarce. I managed to snag normal hotel rooms for most of our trip except for the last city, where I was stuck between a love hotel and a wildly expensive, albeit normal, hotel. Financial necessity declared that my broke ass would have to stay in the love hotel, so I booked it. To be clear, I'd never been in one before. All I knew was that young Japanese couples would stay there when their parents wouldn't cut it. But whatever, it'll be fine, and we were saving money, so I just shoved all my worries into the back of my mind. Fast forward a month, I'm on the train with my aunt headed towards the hotel. My worries started clawing their way out of the closet, so I texted my friends to see if they knew anything about love hotels. They said it might resemble a normal hotel room, but beware of the TV and any stray love toys. I joked that I might turn on the TV myself just to satisfy my curiosity and hope that the volume wasn't at max. Shortly after, we arrived at our station around 9 p.m. All was dark outside, and it was a 10-minute walk to the hotel. At least, it should have been 10 minutes. But outside of major cities, Google Maps in Japan is whack and favors efficiency over all safety and reason. I've got over a hundred other stories about Japanese Google Maps attempts at murder, but anyways, this time, it led us down a dark alleyway consisting of a narrow ledge next to a canal. I say canal, but it was really a glorified storm drain waiting to swallow unwary tourists. No, sorry, we did not fall in, but the ledge was barely wide enough to accommodate ourselves, much less the luggage we were dragging, so our walk was significantly extended by our tightrope back down the alley. Finally, we reached the end of the alley and turned left, where the hotel is supposed to be. And surprise! We're in the back lot of the hotel, and the exit towards the front is a locked gate. But I'm not about to go back down by the watery depths of doom, and the locking mechanism itself was simple enough for any buffoon to figure out. So we low-key break into the other side of the property. On the other side, I took in the surroundings. I hoped, to my aunt, that it just looked like a sad bootleg Las Vegas. But I recognized that the street was, in fact, lined with a parade of quirky, kitschy love hotels. Thankfully, the outside of love hotels rarely advertise anything of the sexual or romantic nature, and our hotel seemed incredibly normal compared to the rest. As we strode into the lobby, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a claw machine and two mannequin torsos displayed by the entrance. They were wearing a maid costume and a BDSM corset. I think so, but I can't say for sure. I dared not to turn my head in case it encouraged my aunt to do the same, and instead power walked straight through towards the reception. There was a wide grin plastered across my face, and I had to stifle a few giggles as I checked in with the staff. Despite the situation I was in, I could still recognize the humor of it. I was checking into a love hotel with my my aunt. I wasn't sure if the fact that we're both women made it look better or worse. Maybe we passed as mother and daughter, but I spoke only Japanese with the staff so my aunt wouldn't understand anything. Also, I guess when you stay at a love hotel, they have to show you to the room. One of the staff came with us into the elevator, so we're standing in that tiny elevator, me, my aunt, and this man. We pass a few floors in silence before I start talking to him in Japanese. Hey, so, like, I know what kind of place this is, but my aunt has no idea. Yes? So I was wondering if there's anything in the room that might, uh, that I should be concerned about? Oh, yes, there are some things, but I can go with you first and explain everything. Great, thanks. The elevator dings and we step out. I look back at my aunt, 
Hey, so, uh, I'm gonna go in with him first and check out the room, okay? Her face immediately darkens, and I realize we must look suspicious, but I've got no choice, so we enter without her. From the entrance, the room looks perfectly normal, praise the powers that be. Then I follow him further in and see the TV. There is video of the adult variety playing on the enormous widescreen with sound. I immediately clap my hand over my mouth, both out of shock and to cover my laughter. It was the kind of laugh you do when you know you've been abandoned by God and all is hopeless, but also despite being a fully grown adult, I'm still wildly immature and I couldn't help but laugh at naked people on TV. Yes, so this is probably the main thing. You can use this remote to change the volume and channel. He lowers the volume until it's almost silent then pushes another button and it changes to the normie channel, where baby pandas are rolling around. I let out a sigh of relief. But if you turn off the TV, he turns it off, then back on again, and lo and behold, the video of the adult variety is back at its original volume. I breathe in sharply and gingerly take the remote from him after he changes the channel again. I gently cradle it in my fingertips, squinting at all the dangerous buttons. This remote has the power to send me straight to hell. We leave the TV as it is, with the baby pandas. So please be careful the TV. There's also the vending machine. He gestures towards what I previously assumed to be a mini fridge. But upon closer inspection, it's a love toy vending machine. At the very least, I had to be grateful that it was subtle. It was an opaque white box, and the only hint as to its contents were small labels in Japanese, with pictures of artificial schlongs. Alright, so maybe it wasn't really subtle, but I was taking any wins I could get at this point. Thankfully, those seemed to be the only two points of concern in the room. He leaves. My aunt steps into the room, and the first thing she says is, So how come he wouldn't let me in first? She stands in the doorway with our luggage almost glaring at me, and I'm sweating bullets because I just spent the last two minutes alone in the room with a stranger man, which should be totally fine because he was an employee, but alas, I'm a girl in a conservative Asian family, so I've just sinned. The best excuse I can come up with is that he was showing me around the room and I use that as a distraction point. Look, this room is so big and nice, and look at the bathroom, it's so spacious, and the TV is so big, and we actually have room to stand around here. Wow, can you believe it? As I rolled for a deception the first time that night, I slid our suitcases in front of the vending machine. They weren't tall enough to cover it up, but desperation and panic were frying my brain, so I left them there. I sank into the couch and pulled out my phone to update my friends on my latest misfortune. Just as I started to message them, I heard my aunt say, What are they selling in this vending machine? In hindsight, it really wasn't a brilliant idea to put our stuff in front of something I didn't want her to notice. But I tried to glance all nonchalantly from my phone like, I don't know man, but don't touch it because if we touch it we pay for it, so don't touch it. And I thanked my lucky stars that she can't read the labels, but I also prayed that she doesn't know what love toys look like. After examining the vending machine, she went to take a shower, giving me a short respite. The TV's been on the entire time because I feared the risk of resetting it, but we'd have to turn it off eventually, so I did and stashed the remote in the corner. By the TV video of the adult variety catalogs which, by the way, are standard in normal Japanese hotel rooms. And she'd seen them earlier on the trip, so I didn't bother with hiding them. I just hoped they would ward her off from the corner with the cursed remote. At that point, I noticed there are two condoms prominently displayed at the head of the bed, and my heart leaps into my throat. Do I hide them or leave them? It all depended on whether my aunt had already noticed them, and I had no clue. If I move them and she comes out and wonders why they're gone, I'm screwed because there's no way she would believe me if I said, what do you mean there were condoms? I begged my friends for advice. One said, swipe them for me. If she asks about it, tell her I'm a poor lonely floozy. Yo, but if I do that, then she's going to ask me why I have floozy friends and send me to the monastery. I could hear the sounds of her finishing in the shower, so I grabbed the condoms and hid them deep in my bag. She doesn't mention anything about them, and the rest of the night went on without any more incident. 
save for a torturous moment where I was struggling to figure out how to turn off the main light. At one point, I desperately considered punching it out, before finding the switch hidden on a panel with a dozen other options for mood lighting. Thankfully, my aunt was asleep by then. The stress of the night's events kept me up for a while, but I knocked out eventually. My first mistake of the next day, however, was sleeping in. My aunt woke up first and started eating breakfast alone. I didn't stay in bed for too long after her, but by the time I started my toast, she was just sipping her tea. We didn't talk much since my mouth was full of bread. I guess this was too boring for her. She glanced behind her at the TV catalogs and picked one up. Remember, these were no ordinary catalogs. They were filled exclusively with the video of the adult variety listings, and they came with color pictures. She slowly flipped through the entire booklet without saying a single word, like she was simply reading a normal magazine or the newspaper. I almost said something or reacted, but clearly we were in the midst of some sick game, so I forced myself to keep eating like a normal person too. She finished browsing, closed the booklets, and turned to put it back. Then she picked up the second catalog. There was not a single glint of emotion in her eyes. I finished eating in terrified silence and went to the mirror to do my makeup. In the corner of my eye, I see her finish the second catalog. She turns around to put it back and picks up the TV remote. We all remember that the TV defaults to a video of the adult variety when it turns on, right? So I'm sweating there by the mirror, all like sweating Jordan Peele dot gif staving off a heart attack as I wait for my inevitable doom and I hear the click of the TV turning on and the buzz of electricity. And then the moans. And at this point, I have no choice but to acknowledge it. So I glance over my shoulder, squinting at the TV without my glasses, and in my most innocent voice, I whisper, What are you watching? But I know damn well what she's watching. And she's like, I don't know, I just turned it on. And thankfully turns it off right after. I almost wish I had perished in my sleep the night before. The both of us were unusually quiet for the rest of the morning. When we left the hotel, the only thing she had to say about it all was, That hotel was pretty old. And that's the story of how I survived a love hotel with my aunt. Well, um, that could have ended one of three ways. Uh, one way you get found out and she uh, calls you out on it. Two, this outcome where she apparently doesn't find out. And three, well, uh, I can't really say it on here, but the internet will definitely fill you in. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to never miss an episode.